Good morning. Look, I can't, I can't believe we get to be here today. How amazing is it that God allows you and I, sinners such as we are, to come and gather his house and sing praises to his holy name? How amazing is that? Listen, I hope you're excited. I hope you're ready for what God has for us today because here at First Baptist DeSoto, you never know what God's going to do on any given Sunday. Amen? You never know who might be saved. You never know who might join the church. You never know how the Holy Spirit may move in your heart and your life to call you to do something you never imagined yourself doing. We are so glad you're here. If you're a visitor, extra special welcome to you. If you're watching online, we want to thank you so much for joining in and tuning in to us. If you want to leave a comment as you're watching, we'd love to pray with you any way we can. If we can do that, just let us know. Message us or comment. We'll get back to you. I want to ask you this week, if you will, pray for a guy named Matt. I was able to share the three circles with Matt this past week, and I'm looking at how God may continue our uh, relationship that we've started developing to be able to share more about how Christ can help him recover the purpose that God has for him in his life through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing what God can do with us through the gospel of Jesus Christ? It is just phenomenal to me. I love it. Hey, Vern, how you doing? Listen, I want to tell you something. Brother Vern and I, after Wednesday night, we had, we had a Sunday school teacher's training here. Uh, and I just want to tell you something. We have the best Sunday school teachers in the state of Missouri here at First Baptist. They are amazing. I'm so thankful for every one of them. They, we, we gathered here. We had Sunday school teachers training. And uh, Vern and I just got to hang out and share uh, afterwards. And I just got to hear a lot about his life. And I love what God has done in Vern's life. And I'm so glad that he uh, is in our church and is one of our deacons and gets to serve. And he's one of our Sunday school teachers. We are blessed to have him along with all of our Sunday school teachers. And what I want to pitch off of that is if you're not in Sunday school, you're missing out on the best Sunday school teachers in the state right here. We got them. So get in a class, and you're going to have a great time doing it. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn a very familiar passage with me, John 3.16. But just put a pin on that, because we're going to be going all throughout the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, if it's too much for you to follow, we have the notes available online, a transcript of the notes that you can go and print out and have for yourself. So those are available for you every week. Have you ever been really glad to see someone like, I mean, really glad. You were waiting, you were hoping, you were searching, you were worrying, and that person shows up and your whole life has changed. And then you get them and you're so proud of them and, and you can't wait. I remember when my sweet baby boy, Jackson, was born. It was so awesome. Remember that day? You don't remember that day, Jackson. It was really cool. And I remember when he was born. And, th th and Kristen, don't even, I don't know if she even recognized this, but th this was, I was so proud to have him, because he was our, our, my firstborn son, that no matter where we would park, no matter what we do, no matter where we was going, whenever we stopped, I would rush to get out the driver's side. I would run around the passenger side to unbuckle him so I could walk in with my son. Why? Because God gave him to me. And I was so proud to have him, and he was so awesome, and he's grown into this awesome young man of God. And I love walking into, I love to be able to, it was my greatest joy when he got to be like three years old, I'm like, hey, Jack's getting the truck. He oh, boop, 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 hops in the truck, puts his little seatbelt on, and hey, man, we're going to the store. And he just boop, 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 hops out the truck, and I get to take him with me. And it was so awesome that I could just go and be like, hey, this is my son. And I loved it because God had given me something so wonderful and so beautiful in him. And now he's like quadrupled that blessing through the rest of the kids. And sometimes I feel weird as a dad because, like, I remember when Jackson, he was four, I'd be so proud to go in a store with him. And now when I go in a store with Jacob, I'm scared to death he's going to do something and, and cause an insurance claim. But as much as I look forward to seeing Jackson when he was born, you see, the world, whether it knows it or not, you and I, whether we know it or not, we are looking for that one. That one who will come and restore us and help us recover the purpose for which you and I and every person on this world, every person on this earth was created for. We are looking for Jesus. Jesus is God's only son, and it's only Jesus who can redeem us of our sin. It's only Jesus who can help us restore this broken relationship with our holy creator. It's only Jesus who can mend this broken image that sin has caused within us. It's only Jesus who can give meaning to our lives. 
And in a day and time when so many in the world are clamoring to have a voice, everybody wants a voice, they want their voice to be heard, it is only Jesus who can give us a voice that really matters, a voice that can talk to the Holy Father, a voice that can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of salvation throughout the entirety of the world. Christ gives that to us. In John chapter 3, Jesus is talking with a man named Nicodemus in this very familiar story for a lot of us. And old Nicodemus, he's a learned man of the Old Testament. He's, he's a godly man. He knows the rules. He knows the regulations. He knows the law. He's doing everything he's supposed to do. He's living right. He's going to church every week. He's doing all these things, but old Nick was still missing something in your life. You may be here this morning, and you're doing all the things you think you're supposed to be doing. You may be watching this morning. You may be doing all the things you think you're supposed to be doing in life, but you feel like something is missing. That's what happened with old Nick. The things he was doing were good. They weren't bad things, but they didn't fix his problem. They didn't help him recover his purpose. They didn't help him have a genuine relationship with God. See, Jesus begins to tell Nicodemus what it means to be saved, what it means to be born again, what it means to have the Holy Spirit come inside you, what it means to place your faith in Him, what it means to have a relationship with the Father. And in John 3.16, Jesus begins to paint this beautiful picture for us this morning. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. and He who does not believe has been judged already, because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Father, for your glory and our good, would you speak to us now by the power of your holy word and your Holy Spirit working in us. Draw us unto you this morning, Father. Speak to our lives through the power of Jesus Christ. Transform lives today, God. It's only you can do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in order to show you how Jesus is the one, I want to help us understand our need for Jesus. I want to help us understand all the things besides Jesus that are unsatisfactory substitutes in our lives and how Jesus is that perfect sacrifice, that, that perfect atoning offering for you and I. That Jesus is the one who's come for you and I so that we may have a genuine relationship with him. That he's not only come for you and I, but that he's come for the entirety of the world. And that by knowing He came for us and knowing He's here for others, this might spur on within us this evangelistic fervor to go out and tell about the one who came to save the souls of the lost. There is a need, but why is there a need for Jesus? The world tells us that we're simply an unintentional development of millions of years of random evolution, that our lives have no inherent meaning, that at our last breath we will cease to exist. This type of thinking has been prevalent in the world for some time, only getting worse and worse. This worldview has caused millions and millions of deaths over the past hundred years. Right now, in our culture, in our society, we see suicide rates skyrocketing. Depression and substance abuse are at an all-time high. You see counselors and social workers' caseloads that are so heavy that they're leaving the field because they can't manage their own emotional health because of the load that's put upon them. We see every sector of society overwhelmed. Why? Because this line of reasoning that we have that's built into us in this worldview that's being pushed down through us is contrary to what the Bible tells us is true. God's Word tells us that out of all of creation, everything in the natural, all things in the supernatural world that came into being, God intentionally created. And that God intentionally created you and I. And that humanity, we are God's special intentional creation, more valuable than any other created thing. For we have been created, Genesis 126 tells us, in the very image of God we bear the image of God and as such we are his representatives here upon the earth 
man was made. We were made to walk in perfect union with God. And for a while, we did. That first man and woman, Adam and Eve, they walked, they lived in perfect harmony, perfect union with God. They enjoyed. Could you imagine a marriage with no arguments? Who was going to have to do the dishes? Nobody cares. Where are we going to eat for supper? It doesn't matter because it's magically going to appear. That would be great, wouldn't it? There's no struggles. There's no crazy cousins to deal with. There's no mother-in-laws. All right. But that didn't last long, did it? Mother-in-law showed up. I'm just picking. Look at Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and ate. And it was upon this bite that Adam and Eve, through a deliberate act of disobedience towards God for not trusting in the very word of God, they became sinners. And through them, every person who's ever born has been born a sinner. Every single one of us, sin not only affected us, it affected all of creation. Every seed born into the ground, every drop of rain that hits the earth, every plant, every animal has been affected by sin. And you may wonder, you may ask yourself here today, you may be sitting, you may be watching online and say, well, am I a sinner? Is, is my neighbor a sinner? Look, I, I know a sinner. I, I've seen a sinner. I didn't think I was a sinner. Romans 3.23 tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all, not some, not a few, not a couple, not many, but all. Sin has infected all of God's creation. See, God has this standard of, of holiness. God has this standard of righteousness. God has this standard of perfection. And guess what, church? None of us meet that standard. And I don't mean to bust your bubble. I'm not trying to step on your toes. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. But the truth is, we are bad people. None of us are good. None of us are righteous. None of us are worthy. Every single one of us are sinners before a holy and righteous God. So what happens because of our sin? If we admit it, we realize that I'm a sin. Hey, I got this problem. I got this thing going on in me. Can I get out of it? Can I have a do-over? Am I going to run out of time? Can I make up for it? What happens because of my sin? Romans 6.23 tells us the inevitableness of sin. For the wages of sin is death. The price of sin is death. Sin separates you and I from a holy and a righteous God. Sin has to be judged. And when God looks upon sin, he can do nothing but penalize. He can do nothing but pour out his holy and righteous wrath upon sin. The great enemy sin brought into this world is death. Death is the enemy of life. Every funeral I've ever preached, I preach that death is the enemy. It's not the original design for us. Death is the byproduct of sin. Ever since sin entered the world, death has been present. It's the enemy of life. It steals from us. It takes from us. It robs us of what God desires for us, eternal life. Sin hinders us because it separates us from God. For God cannot be in a relationship. He cannot tolerate sin. And you may be sitting here this morning, you think, well, I didn't realize I was that bad of a person. I don't mean to be that guy, but you're worse than what you think you are right now. And I say that, and I say that because I'm worse than what you could ever think I am. As bad as you think that I am, as bad as wicked as you think I could have ever been, I'm way worse. Our sin knows no depravity. Our depravity knows no bounds, rather. God looks upon you and I worse than we could ever be and he has to punish us for our sin, doesn't he? Sin leads to death. Speaking to the church at Ephesus, Paul reminds the Ephesian believers, listen to what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You were, listen to what he says, listen to the words he uses. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. Paul is telling those that are saved. He's telling us this to remind us of two things. One, to remember where we came from. 
to remember that every single one of us, prior to Christ coming in our lives, prior to us accepting the sacrificial, atoning death of Jesus Christ, prior to us repenting of our sins and placing our faith in Jesus, prior to that every single one of us was dead in our trespass sin, we could do nothing, we were headed to bust hell wide open. So Paul's reminding you and I this morning, he says, hey, you were that guy and you were that woman, and he tells us this for another reason. To remember there's a whole world out there just like we used to be that are dead and they're trespassing in sin. And just like someone had the courage, someone had the bravery to pray for you, someone was intentional to share the gospel with you, someone was intentional to lead you to Jesus, Paul is reminding you and I that there's a world full of those who are dead in their trespasses in, and without Jesus Christ, they are going to go to hell. It's almost like he's looking at you and I this morning saying, what are you going to do about it? We should see those without Christ. And we shouldn't label them. Man, we put labels on so many people for so many things. We say this person's a this and they're a that and they're this and they belong to this group and this club and this identity. But here's the deal. They're all dead and they're trespassing sin without Jesus. So what does it matter what they call themselves? Paul says we were dead in sin, just like those that used to be us. And in order for sin to be forgiven, in order for salvation of one person to take place, another has to be sacrificed. There has to be a substitute, but we know that there's an unsatisfactory substitute. You ever had a bad substitute? Michaela loves to bake. She's really good at baking, but when she first got in this baking game, she wasn't so hot on the baking. See, she would love to read, but she wouldn't read all the details. And in baking, details are really, Miss Catherine, they're super, super important, right? Chris, you understand what I'm telling you? Details are really important. And she, one time, she didn't have enough butter. She was making this cake. And so, in order to substitute for butter, she took what she needed for the butter, and she used baking soda. So she made this cake, and she bakes it, and it was, looked amazing, had a great smell. She cuts it up, and she brings it in there, and she begins to serve it. And I'm eating it, and I was like, this has a unique flavor and texture, sweetheart. I said, tell me the ingredients of this wonderful, delicious thing I'm eating. And she says, well, I put this, this. I said, well, hold on, hold on. I said, how much of the baking soda did you put in there? Well, I was out of butter, so I just added some extra. Well, you realize that not everything's a good substitute, is it? In the Old Testament, God set up this sacrificial system, and part of that system was called the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would come and he would cleanse himself and he would go and he would sacrifice a bull for himself for his own sins. He would go in uh, to the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle blood on the altar for himself. And then he would come. We find ourselves getting to Leviticus 16, 15. Just to give us an idea, I want to show you what this sacrifice does. So the instructions for the priest, after he cleansed himself, he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, And bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. So what he would do, he would sacrifice a bull for himself so he would be cleansed. Then he would take this bull and he would sacrifice it for the sins of all the people. He he, he would sacrifice this, this goat, rather, excuse me, for the sins of all the people. And then he would take a second goat. So this one goat was the sacrificial goat. He was the atoning, he was the substitute goat. He would take another goat and he would lay his hands on that goat's head and he would basically symbolically put the sins of the people upon this goat and he would send him out into the wilderness. So these two goats had two very important meanings. One took took the sins of the people and one took the sins away from the people. But there was a problem. The sacrificial system didn't really work too well. Why not? Well, for one, the people kept sinning. They kept messing up. They kept doing what God told them not to do. Let me ask you, since becoming a Christian, if you're a Christian today, have you sinned since becoming a Christian? No, not you, huh? You would never. They kept sinning, so there needed to be another sacrifice. Another reason they kept having to have a sacrifice, because that sacrifice that was given that one goat wasn't enough. It was never going to be enough. Commenting on the sacrificial system, the author of Hebrews in chapter 9, verse 22, makes a statement. And according to the law, one almost 
may say, all things are cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. See, sin demands, demands a sacrifice. In order for the people to be forgiven of sins, a sacrifice had to take place. So let's ask the question, would we rather pay for our own sins? Would we rather lay down our own life for our own sins, or would we rather have a sacrifice, have a substitute do it for us? I'm going to go with substitute. So what do we do? We keep on sinning and the sacrifice is not good enough. So what do we do? We need a perfect sacrifice. But here's the deal. Are any of us perfect enough to be the sacrifice? Even if one of us here in this room, even if you wanted to lay down your life for your own son or your own daughter or your grandchildren or your spouse, even if you wanted to, you couldn't because you wouldn't be good enough. I'm not good enough to save my own family because I'm a sinner. Sin permeates every ounce of me, every thought, every desire, every motivation has to be washed in the blood of Jesus. We're not good enough. The prophet Isaiah makes this very clear in chapter 64, verse 6. He paints us this picture. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us like a leaf, wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Every single one of us are unclean in our sin. And any attempt to fix ourselves amounts to dirty, filthy rags. And because of this, our sin carries us away. But there's good news. (laughs) Because God created us in His image. Because God loves us so much. Because God desires a relationship with us. Even in our sin, Christ died for us. Listen again to what Jesus tells Nicodemus in John 3.16. Listen to this. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Mind blown. Did you you catch that? Notice this. Romans 6.23 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the Lord God. Romans uh, 6.23 tells us that the penalty of sin is death. But God, knowing our sin... He still sends Jesus into the world to die for the sins of the world. And Jesus says, look, anybody who puts their faith in my son, anybody who puts their faith on Jesus on the cross, anybody who does that, guess what's going to happen to them? They're not going to perish with me. They're not going to come to the, succumb to the enemy of death, which is the byproduct of sin. But instead, they're going to have eternal life. See, Jesus is the perfect one who came at the right place and at the right time, doing exactly what was needed. I, I, I have found myself on several occasions throughout my life being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I remember when I was in junior high, when we were riding three-wheelers on the river, it was a big group of us. My dad used to ride a lot, and I was riding on the back of a three-wheeler with him, and there was a whole group, and we were over here, maybe about 30 yards from everybody, and we were riding, and we were just flying down this river and having a good old time on the sandbar. And all of a sudden, I remember we were going, and I looked down, and there was no more sand under us for about 20 feet or so. And we had went over a sandbar that we didn't know was there. And we're in the air, and we're flipping and spinning, and we land, and the bike lands on top of us, knocks us out, and he broke some ribs, knocked me out, messed my heel up on my, on my foot. And it's a really, really bad situation. But to think about it, a week or two earlier, that would not have been the case. That sandbar would not have been there. We were simply finding ourselves at the wrong place at the wrong time. And when I think back to my salvation, when I think back to the salvation that Christ offers us, Jesus was not only at the right place, He was on the cross at the right time to take our sin and our shame. Commenting on Jesus John the Apostle in in 1 John 2, verse 2, he makes this statement. This is a beautiful statement here, church. This is is a statement that should should dwell down in our hearts. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. He is the atoning sacrifice, the atone to make right with. He makes right with God our sin. He becomes the sacrifice so we don't have to pay the penalty. We need to see really how big of an idea this is. We could not make it right no matter what we did. And if you're here today, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you that God loves you so much that Jesus did what you could never do. 
if you're watching online today, I want to let you know that Jesus did what you could never do. Even if you wanted to, in all of your strength and might, you could not pay for your own sin. You could not right the wrongs that have been done in your heart. But Jesus could. And he did. He makes it right through his real, painful, historical death. And notice Notice what the author says. Jesus didn't come and die for his sins. Whose sins did he die for? Beloved, look around. Jesus died for our sins. And catch this. This is even bigger. Jesus not come and just die for those who are saved in his room. His death makes salvation available to all. For all, the gospel message goes out to everyone in the world that all who would hear would respond to the Holy Spirit and come in and be saved in Jesus' name. His death is applied to all who respond to the free gift. Jesus says, not only our sins, but I'm going to die for the sins of the world. And this is where it gets down to us, the one who came. We're kicking off our evangelistic initiative for the year, 2021 Gospel Interactions. Every one of you, if you've got a bulletin, you have one of these. Uh, I don't even have it anymore. I flipped it on my you have a thing in your bulletin where it says, I've, I've been a, making disciples this week by. We actually fill that out every week and, and turn it in so we can be encouraged because we want to be able to know that we're sharing the gospel. We're making a difference because we know Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He died for the sins of our neighbors. He, he died for the sins of those in our community and our, those in our county. He died for those sins of everyone in our state and our nation. But how will they know if we don't tell them? If they don't hear the gospel, they don't see Christ lived out in our lives, if we're not praying for them, if we're not searching out for them, if we're not seeking to find them so that they may hear the gospel, just like we were, they are dead in their trespasses in. If they were to die today, they're going to bust hell wide open. Without Jesus, they have no hope, beloved. We have the hope that we can give them. We can change. We can change this county. We can change the state of Missouri with the gospel. It's only Jesus Christ. It's only the gospel that can save us. Only Jesus that can turn our lives around. And if, look, if he did it to someone like me, I promise he can do it to anybody else in this state. I promise. Will we take up the charge? Church, will we take up the challenge? Will we take up this mantle and be gospel people who are sharing the life-saving message that Jesus offers us? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. God's grace saved you, and God's grace saved me. By his great love, he poured out his mercy. And I don't know what station you have in life, it doesn't matter if you're a stay at home person. If you work a full-time job, if you work a part-time job, if you're retired, it doesn't matter where you do, it doesn't matter what kind of house you got, it doesn't matter what kind of car you drive, it doesn't matter what's in your bank account. Every single one of us have been poured out richly and received richly the mercy of God. Because of His abundance of mercy, He didn't give us what we deserve. Will we take the gospel to the world? Will we be that person who's at the right place at the right time sharing with the right person? You never know. You never know what God's got in store for you. You never know what, how God may use you. And to know that Jesus, today, you may be here today, today is exactly the right time that you've showed up to hear the gospel message that you can give your life to Jesus. It's amazing when it shows up, when Jesus, when you recognize he showed up just to take care of what you couldn't take care of. I remember when I was in eighth grade, I was about to get in this fight with this guy. We had prepped it and read it during recess. We said after school, it's going to go down, right? It's about to happen. It's getting real. So I went over there. I said, hey, we're going we're gonna to handle this. And he said, no, I don't want to fight no more. I said, cool. And so I go over there and tell my friend. I said, look, we're not fighting no more. He says, I don't think that he has the same message that you have because he's got seven friends coming off the bus coming our way. I turned around and said, oh, my goodness, it's about to go down. So there's eight of them and two of us, and I'm really nervous, and I'm super scared. And uh, my friend Ira, he looks at me and says, Brad, don't worry, we got this. And he pulls up a shirt, he reaches his pants, he pulls out a metal desk leg, you know, ripped off the desk. He says, we got this, Brad. And I realized right then, at that moment, I didn't have to be scared no more because my friend had what I didn't have. Everything was going to work out well. I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story. You don't need to know it. Not important. 
But at that moment, I realized that I couldn't have defended myself, but my friend had everything we needed to be successful. Well, but listen, you, you, you cannot fix your life. Try. I dare you to try. It's not going to work. You can't do it. But Jesus can. Your life may be broken right now. It may be in shambles. You may be wondering what's going on. You may be wondering how it's going to get fixed. But guess what? Jesus is the right one who came at the right time for you.